The following program is a UW-TV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection with Al Page. Our guest is Robert Bacher, professor of paleontology at the University of Colorado and a guest lecturer at the University of Washington. What does a paleontologist do for laughs? For laughs? laughs. <laughs> I mean, what's funny to a That's paleontologist? That's like asking what a bassoonist does for laughs. If a bassoonist didn't love what they were doing, they wouldn't play the bassoon because they'd make a lot more money as an arbitrage or a dental hygienist. On a dig, have you ever been tempted to sing the leg bones connected to the thigh bone? No, but I read, I read uh, to my field crew from Ezekiel 36 and 37. And if you haven't read that, you go back and get your Gideon Bible. You read those two chapters of the prophet Ezekiel. And that sets you up for being a good paleontologist. Doesn't he? What does a paleontologist do? Do? Uh, what do you do for a living? Two totally different questions. Our calling, and it is a calling, it's not, it's a true vocation, you are called. It's like being called to the priesthood or uh, being called to uh, play the bassoon, similar things. You are called to um, bring to life the dead bones, to bring them to life for all of society, for everybody, not just for the specialists, for the three other people who can read your technical papers. Oh, it's more than bones, too. It's, it could be plants, it could be trilobites, it could be crabs. Mm -hmm. It could be worms. It could be soil, actually. One of the hottest parts of paleontology right now is fossil soil. Soil forms everywhere. Soil forms on the surface of things, surface of sand and mud and whatnot. You'll find a dinosaur covered in a layer of rock. That rock used to be soil at some point. And you can read climate from the fossil soil if you know what to look for. You can tell whether it was hot or cold, whether it was dry or wet what sort of feeling that brontosaur had as it padded across the meadow. What kind of training do you need to do that well? It's funny, right now some of the best paleontologists have little or no union cards, like Jack Horner, my opposite number up in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, he and I are the most frequently cited paleontologists. I went the usual route, Ivy League colleges and Yale and Harvard and so forth. Jack doesn't have an earned degree to his name. He's brilliant, very productive. He's a very smart guy. You need a great breadth of sensitivity if you're bringing life to bones and to soil. What, what fields are you drawing from? Anatomy, of course. You've got to put muscle on the bone. Bones preserve with great fidelity. A bone is preserved in its shape, in its microstructure. I mean, it's all there. But the muscle is not. So you have to read the bone to put back on the the muscles and the ligaments and the nerves and the blood vessels. And you can do that with comparative anatomy. So you have to dissect things. And you have to take mm -hmm. cats apart and turtles apart and turtle uh, salamanders apart. So anatomy is the foundation. No, that's one of them. There's no one foundation, which is why probably formal education isn't enough. There is no one core. Anatomy is one very important uh, mm -hmm. tool. Geology? A special type of geology, though. It's the geology of ancient environments. As I said, fossil soils. You can go to beds in Utah and you can see a red band tinged with purple from which came a, a brontosaurus that was dug up. You have to know what to look for in that red band, what subset of clues are there that tell you what that dinosaur felt literally under its toes during its environmental times. Chemistry. That works into what I'd call environmental uh, reconstruction. Yeah, the, the fact that a lot of um, brontosaurus are found in red tinged bone. Chemically, that's dehydrated iron oxide of a peculiar form. And uh, with brontosaur bones and brontosaur graves, you find these little hard, pale uh, lumps, which chemically are amorphous uh, uh, calcite, a peculiar form. Uh, and that peculiar form, uh, chemically, of calcite is growing today in peninsular India or at Savo Park in Africa during the dry season. It's both a chemical and geological signal to us paleontologists that brontosaur environments have been restored completely upside down. Instead of being wet, they were dry. Instead of being swampy, they were a mosaic of very, very uh, arid meadows. Biology. Certain aspects of biology. Um, anatomy could be considered biology. Uh, ecology, certainly. Because we don't get just one dinosaur. We get a lot. In one bed, you'll find dinosaurs and turtles and crocodiles and lungfish 
and burrows left by uh, beetles. The beetles don't preserve, but the burrows do. Uh, plant fragments, of course. Do you have to be creative? Do you have to know when to take something from a particular field and apply it? You have to be very opportunistic. That's why it's hard to train a paleontologist, a good one, in a formal setting, because you have to be such an opportunist. You have to have lots of tools in your repertoire. Why did you become a paleontologist? Because you're a good opportunist? I was called. I remember the day, specifically. It was a spring day in 1954. I remember exactly where I was, at the coffee table of one of my grandfather's houses. He built houses for a living. Uh, before me was a Life magazine, which as a cover story had the, uh, the Age of Dinosaurs, uh, reproduction of the great uh, oil painting, which is at Yale now, of Life Through the Ages. And that was my first exposure to dinosaurs in the fourth grade. I was just riveted to that magazine and announced that I was going to study dinosaurs for the rest of my life. And of course, my parents nodded and knowingly knew that this intense mm -hmm. interest would burn out after a couple months mm -hmm. and I'd get back to more serious pursuits, you know, being a surgeon or a dentist or an arbitrager. Uh, they still hope that I'll become a dentist or a surgeon or an arbitrager. Mm -hmm. It seems natural that kids are fascinated with dinosaurs, but why are so many adults fascinated with dinosaurs? I think the answer is the same for both adults and kids. It's another world, and it's real. As I wrote Steven Spielberg once, dinosaurs are nature's special effects. These are fantastic animals, but they're real. They're real in what sense? They actually existed. But no longer. There are a lot of other animals that are extinct, like the dodo bird, that we're no longer interested in. People are also interested in uh, mammoths. Saber-toothed cats are very popular. Uh, and if you find a place where there are a lot of fossils in the country rock, you'll find kids picking up trilobites or brachiopods, whatever is there. Something from the past has enormous fascination. Mummies, pyramids, uh, the Sphinx, arrowheads, relics of, the, uh, uh, of, of another world separated from us by this enormous curtain of time. That fascinates kids. As soon as kids can understand something that there is this otherworldliness about dinosaurs. And even if first grade, or even someone in kindergarten, they know that dinosaurs aren't with us and they have very little appreciation of time, right? They really don't know that their grandmother is 60 years old. But they have some appreciation of the fact the world of dinosaurs was real and genuine. It's not fake, it's not made up, but it's not with us anymore. Dinosaurs are portrayed all over the society in all sorts of ways. What are some of the common myths you see when you see how dinosaurs are portrayed? Well, one of the biggest myths, and it has two parts, is that number one, dinosaurs are extinct. And that's a myth, that's not true, that's demonstrably false. And related to that is that dinosaurs were stupid. Now, a lot of dinosaurs had small brains, that's true. But the brainiest animals of the Mesozoic, the era of dinosaurs, were in fact dinosaurs. Now, we existed back then, our ancestors did. Mammals, in fact, primates existed back then. The earliest primate, the earliest proto-monkey, uh, with hopes to evolve into higher forms of life, like, like orangutans or secular humorists. Uh, the earliest proto-primate was coeval with and lived around the feet of Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus rex. What kind of size are we talking about? Hairball size, I mean, you know, just a little, little furry balls, about the size of a shrew with a quivering nose. The brain about the size of a living primitive mammal, and much smaller than the brain of the dinosaurs that chased it. There were little dinosaurs, oh, 100 pounders, down to 10 pounds, chasing our ancestors. The dinosaurs were chasing us because at the time they had much better brains than we did. The brainiest dinosaurs, in fact, were as complex intellectually as modern birds. And if you've ever kept a parakeet for a long time, you know modern birds, in fact, can be quite complex. Tell us some more about the intelligence of animals. How do you measure the intelligence of an extinct animal? You can look at uh, their behavior, the direct result of their behavior. Say fossil footprints tells us what is dinosaurs actually did and how fast they did it. The most complex dinosaur society we know about, uh, paradoxically enough, comes from a small brain dinosaur, the brontosaurus, which did not have a lot of brain for their size. And yet you never find a baby brontosaur trackway footprints by itself, ever. Every single one ever found is in, accompanied by adult footprints, intimately. So if you were born a brontosaurus, you weren't on your own. If you're born a turtle today, that's it. You come out of the egg, there's no adult help at all. And infant mortality is mm -hmm. astronomical in turtles. No preschool. No preschool. That's true of most lizards and snakes. A few lizards and snakes will curl up around their eggs mm -hmm. and protect them a short time. 
Brontosaurs were always accompanied by an adult. From birth to death, you were in an adult society. And therefore, you were also with your older brothers and sisters. You were in a multi-tiered society. That's as complex as a herd of elephants or a troop of baboons. And this is a dinosaur with a very small brain. Now, that's very interesting. Maybe the notion of intelligence shouldn't be limited to the thought processes that goes on in the brain. It, uh, intelligence has something to do with your interaction with other members of your own species. That's sort of the nature of the question. Once again, if you try to rank animals on the basis of intelligence, is it really sort of an empty exercise? Uh, You've got to be more specific than intelligence. You have to say, okay, you can rank animals in degrees of social complexity, degrees of parental care, maybe. Like Brontosaurus clearly had a lot of parental care. The young were never out of sight of, as far as we can see, adults. Uh, there are lots of um, living animals with bigger brains than Brontosaurus where there's much less parental care. You could rank animals by the size of their brain, which is basically the size of the memory capacity. Mm -hmm. And we humans have the biggest brain, the biggest memory capacity, information processing unit of uh, any animal alive today or any animal extinct. Once again, is this sort of artificial? Do we try to, when we deal with these kinds of questions, always try to make us human beings the measuring rod for things such as intelligence? Oh, of course. Man is the measure of all things, or mankind, or personkind, if you're, you're from Boulder. Uh, mm -hmm. There is this notion, even in science, not, uh, mm -hmm. that to be relevant, you've got to explain or put the spotlight on human success, human uh, uh, evolution. Um, and in a way, I guess that's justifiable. We certainly dominate the world now. Uh, but up until recently, the human evolutionary story was a little sideshow. Primates have not been terribly important in the evolution of the world until the last 10,000 years. If you drop the human of today into the period when dinosaurs were at their peak, their most powerful, what would a human being see? A lot of big feet. <laughs> if you would drop down and put your eyes in the eyes of Purgatorius, that's the earliest primate, this small little furball, what you'd see is a lot of big feet. I mean, the dinosaurs were the giant animals, and the big animals, and the medium-sized animals, and the small animals. And all the mammals were the sort of flotsam and jetsam, the tiny little things. Um, so that the dinosaur dominance was extraordinary. It was on all environments, in yeah. deserts, in, near the pole, in snow, in sand, everywhere, and from every size, from the size of a cat on up to 50 tons. That was just complete dinosaur hegemony. 50 tons, what kind of physical dimensions are we talking about, height? Oh, Wait. let's see, the tallest dinosaur would get you about 60 feet, 62 feet. That'd be Supersaurus, standing up on its hind legs. The longest, is Seismosaurus, I'll get you 150 feet long from nose to tail, which is longer than any animal alive today. The heaviest would be Brachiosaurus, and I'll run you 50 tons, 50 metric tons, over 10,000 pounds, and that's heavier than 10 average circus elephants. And they ran herds? The Brontosaurus did. Now, the three I just mentioned, uh, Supersaurus, Seismosaurus, Brachiosaurus, mm -hmm. we know from the footprints all of these moved in herds of 10, 20, 30. So you could have up to 30 adults, uh, 40, 50 tons apiece, which is a lot of meat on the hoof. The earth moves. No, it wouldn't, though. Mm -hmm. That's, it's an irony here. The word brontosaurus means thunder lizard, right? The earth was supposed to shake. In fact, you look at the feet of these animals, they have enormous cushion pads, like elephants. Uh, if you've done any camping in Africa, you know you cannot hear elephants come through your camp. They make no noise, mm -hmm. because the, every footstep is cushioned by these great pads. You can hear a zebra go through camp. It's got those hard hooves. Uh, so the earth wouldn't shake. And their lifespan? Short. Uh, the way I w grew up learning, learning about dinosaurs, they lived forever like giant tortoises, hundreds and hundreds of years, and grew mm -hmm. slowly. We know that's absolutely untrue. Many dinosaurs have been studied by thin section. You take a dinosaur bone, you cut it, and down to the molecular level, it's very well preserved. So. Uh, under high magnification, you can see how each circle, each cylinder of bone crystals was laid down as that animal grew. And you can tell how fast that growth took place. Dinosaurs grew incredibly fast, as fast as birds today. An ostrich goes from egg to 100 pounds, six or eight months. Uh, dinosaur growth was as fast. So a brachiosaurus at 50 tons might be only 30 years old. 
I might reach maturity at 20 tons in eight years, nine years, and probably senile at 50 or 60. If a dinosaur did not die from natural causes, what would be the most likely way it would die? Perhaps being chewed up by another dinosaur? Depends which kind of dinosaur you're talking about. The brontosaurs were so immense mm -hmm. that as adults, if they stayed in the group, they probably were invulnerable. There was no predator big enough to attack them. But they lived in a dry environment with severe droughts. Uh, in fact, we just published a paper in Colorado on the soils uh, found near Brachiosaurus, the biggest of these brontosaur-type dinosaurs. And that animal lived and died around a saline lake like the Salt Lake. So the, the dry season would be very, very tough. I would imagine then that drought would be the biggest killer mm -hmm. for those guys. And if you're talking about later in the Cretaceous, when the climates were wetter, it was easier for the plain eaters to get food and water. And they were relatively smaller. Uh, predation may be one of the more important agents. Generally, the wetter an environment, the more important predation mm -hmm. is. And the key is to survive childhood. Well, from a Darwinian point of view, that's not enough. You've got to survive childhood and you've got to breed. Because until you get your genes into the pool to the next generation, uh, you're a dead loss from an evolutionary point of view. I want to come back to evolution in a minute, but let's change the subject. Are animals portrayed correctly in popular literature? I understand you're not a friend of Kipling. Oh, mm. Rudyard Kipling, I have a special, gra he's, he's a great writer. The Man Who Would Be King is a wonderful, wonderful story. With it, made, it, made it to a great movie with him. Uh, mm -hmm. Michael Caine, right? Um, however, in the mm -hmm. stories of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the snake and Ricky Tikki Tavi, the mongoose, I'm afraid he, uh, Kipling portrayed the, the reptiles mm -hmm. as uh, nasty and unfeeling and easily outwitted by the clever little warm-blooded furball. So I guess I take issue mm -hmm. with him in that particular way. I have a pet snake called Bubba. I think mm -hmm. Bubba has a lot of smarts. At least Bubba has outwitted 54 adult gerbils in the last year. Walt Disney, what do you think of Disney movies and cartoons as they portray animals? One of my most vivid memories as a kid was going to the old uh, uh, Radio City Music Hall and seeing The African Lion, which was a Disney feature-length nature film. And remember, Disney was the first to market feature-length nature films and really expensive, well-done nature films on television. So yeah, Disney has given us cartoons, but Disney gave us some of the, the best commercially viable uh, um, nature movies. Um, so it's a mixed bag, I th and I think the intelligent child, the intelligent adult can distinguish between a really well-made cartoon, but it's a cartoon, and a really well-made nature film. Animals in zoos, are they portrayed correctly? Mm. It's hard on zoos. Zoos don't get enough support, they really don't. And the bigger your enclosure, on average, the, the happier the animal, also the more complex the, the enclosure. Carnivores like to take things apart. You want to make a bear happy, throw in an old stereo or something you can take apart, or throw in a rotten log and take it apart. Uh, the limitation on American zoos is mostly financial rather than conceptual. They've got the right plans. And without zoos, we'd lose an awful lot of species. Most zoos in the world now their main purpose is to maintain genetic diversity in animals that are rare or extinct in the wild. Uh, I don't know how much that activity is known by the general public, but in that fact, uh, what they're about. Are dinosaurs in museums handled well? It depends on the museum. We have a museum in Colorado, in Denver. All the dinosaur skeletons were mounted by amateurs, people without PhDs, in the 1930s, and they're damn good. I mean, the front legs are straight up, they have good posture. I don't know how they decided to mount them that way, but they've done really well. Uh, go to the Smithsonian, though, dinosaurs mounted at about the same time, and they just look so clumsy. The poor Triceratops is out like this with its elbows sticking sideways. It looks like the hind end of the Triceratops would go faster than the front end. Well, you might say, ah, government committee at work, right? Uh, so it really varies, and it's hard, it's hard to explain why some museums are so successful and some aren't. It's not money. The Smithsonian's had a fair bit of money, and the Denver Museum, little. How are dinosaurs portrayed at the Field Museum? Oh, the Field Museum in Chicago? That's a great place. Uh, it's one of my favorite museums. They have a wonderful foyer. You walk in, and there's a Gorgosaurus, relative of Tyrannosaurus Rex, standing over its prey, a wonderful centerpiece. A lot of, you have to have a sense of showmanship to mount a dinosaur. Let's go back to evolution. How much do we really know about evolution? Are we still making finds? 
Oh, mercy, yes. We know more now than we did 10 years ago. We also know that a lot of what we thought we knew 10 years ago is just wrong. Which is? Um, evolution, it turns out, is very rare. The way I learned it, evolution happens all the time. Natural selection is weeding out the animals that are not fit enough, that are the wrong shape or have the wrong hair color or the wrong behavior. And every way, and every day, every species is getting better and better, being you know, honed by the environment. That's just not true. We have a very, very good fossil record of how primates evolved, uh, horses and so forth, dinosaurs. And if you look at a thick, thick layer of rock representing 10 million years, most of the time, your animals aren't changing at all. You go 10,000 years, 20,000 years, 100,000 years, a million years, 2 million years, and these skeletons show no change at all anywhere, even though the environment is changing. And that's extraordinary. Even though the world was changing and the habitats were changing, the animals aren't evolving. How do you explain this? Well, this is the, uh, a classic uh, a problem in paleontology. In fact, it's got a name. It's called punctuated equilibrium, or punk -eek, I call it. P-U-N-K-E-E-K, -E -E punk -eek. Uh, a name uh, coined by uh, Steve Gould up at Harvard. Um, the way to explain it is using a very, very old explanation. That is, uh, genes are really complicated. You've got genes that determine your shape and your behavior and your eye color and your physiology. But unfortunately, the genes aren't mapped out one to one. There isn't one gene that gives you a nose shape and another gene that gives you a hip shape, mm -hmm. and another separate gene that gives you uh, digestive uh, enzymes. Complex interaction. Bingo. Your nose and your teeth and your hair and your stomach each are controlled by many genes interacting with each other. And those different groups of genes also interact with, with the groups that are responsible for other parts of the body. So it's like this enormous interwoven bureaucracy, genetic bureaucracy. You can't reach in, evolution can't reach in and sort of you know, flick out the bad genes because they're parts of these networks. You know, Bureaucrats protect each other, right? So it's genetic, cover your ass. You, know? uh, mm. you need a very rare genetic event to break this intertwined genetic control and get some major improvement. Uh, and that brings, brings me up to the other thing we now know about evolution. On average, animals aren't perfect. They're not even close to perfect. I was brought up to believe that the human eye is this paragon of perfection. So is the human jaw and the human foot. You know, beautifully designed, elegantly designed piece of machinery to the old philosophers that proved that God existed because we're so perfect, our bodies. To the classical evolutionists, it proved that evolution works so fast that we're kept perfect. In fact, it's not true. If you study anatomy carefully, you can find many cases where we're not perfect. We're not even close. We're just a hodgepodge of Rube Goldberg devices. Uh, the lower back, for instance. A lot of we humans have lower back problems. That's a design flaw. Here we are with upright posture, and we have to carry things. And we have no warranty. There's no warranty for parts and labor. And back problems are as old as human species, human society. We're not perfect. What do we know about the extinction of dinosaurs that we didn't know 10 years ago? I think we know that it's a, um, what killed off the dinosaurs was the same thing that killed off the mammoths not so long ago or the great saber-toothed cats of the Miocene 22 million years ago, or the great saber-toothed mammal-like reptiles before the dinosaurs 220 million years ago. There have been these waves of extinction, not just one, but, oh, there have been about 10 since the first dinosaur. And this, uh, out there, there is an agent, an extinction agent, a serial killer, if you will, which is very selective because its victims, the victims of mass extinction, never are cold-blooded animals on land, ever. They're not turtles, or crocodiles, or alligators, or frogs, or salamanders, or toads, or snakes, or lizards, ever. An individual species of toad will go extinct, but you don't find all of the world, all the toads dying at once, ever. But there was a time 10,000 years ago when nearly all the elephants everywhere in the world went extinct. And with the mastodons and giant ground sloths, so this mass murderer hits the dominant, warm-blooded, active, smart, complex animals, but not the little, humble, cold-blooded animals. That's interesting. And how did the process work for dinosaurs? It took a while. It wasn't one weekend of mayhem. All the dinosaurs just didn't show up dead one Monday morning. You know, didn't show up for work. Someone called. They're all dead, right? Um, it was a complicated event. It took about six million years. The whole age of dinosaurs is about 140. In the last six million years, there were pulses of extinction. You'd get 
most of the dinosaur species dying out, a few surviving, and they would split into new species, and then they'd go extinct. And after three or four of these pulses, you're down to one common dinosaur, Triceratops, and finally, it's gone, okay. and they're no more. And when will the last paleontologist be extinct? Oh, if I, if I were a cynical, I would say in the near future when the world blows up. How can you tell whether a paleontologist is good or not? Mm. Oh, it's really, really quite simple. Uh, we have hard data. We have fossils. We have a lot of them. We have fossil soils. Uh, a paleontological theory is, uh, to use a philosopher's term, falsifiable. You can go out there and look at more fossils. You can go somewhere else and dig up more and see if it fits the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as we get, for instance, this picture of how evolution works, that's, mm -hmm. where, that's built up not by one fossil or two or a hundred, but tens of thousands mm -hmm. so you can test from all things. over the world. Are you a good paleontologist? Am I a good paleontologist? Well, I seem to be a famous paleontologist. Is that the same as being good? Not necessarily. What's left for you to do? Are you going to suffer dinosaur burnout? I haven't yet. I haven't s suffered burnout with Labrador retrievers either, or bassoons or the trombone, I play the trombone. I used to play it semi-professionally. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs are an uh, extremely rich subject, and I spend as much time studying plants and soil and lungfish as the context of dinosaurs, as I study the dinosaur themselves. Some paleontologists are quite narrow, mm -hmm. and they, they can make a contribution, certainly, but if you want to attack mm -hmm. the bigger questions of how does evolution mm -hmm. work? So there's much to do. Oh, mercy, yes. As soon as this interview is over, I'm back to the Burke Museum and spend more time diagramming that wonderful Yanchuanosaurus. Robert Bacher, professor of paleontology at the University of Colorado and a guest lecturer at the University of Washington upon reflection. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org classics.